So again, as we, uh, as we already read from 1 John chapter 3, I want, I want you to, I want, I want to read it again. I want you to hear these words of the uh, Apostle John. I want you to keep these words in mind because uh, he, he kind of spells out, he kind of spells out, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what prayer is uh, as far as, you know, again, the thing is when we, when we read these verses, I guarantee you there's going to be one phrase that sticks out to you and you're going to take hold of, but you're not going to hear the other phrases. So let me read it again. I want you to keep all the, these words in mind. When John says, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. You see that? Now that's what we remember. We hear that. Anything we ask. Oh God, anything we ask. It says, but then hear what it says. Because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Now there, 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 there's some significance in these words. Even the first part, he says, if our hearts do not condemn us, all right? We, nobody knows you like you know you, all right? Nobody knows your heart uh, like you know your heart. Uh, uh, and I'm not just talking about physical heart, you know, your, the heartbeat. I mean, you say, yeah, I, you know, we know our heartbeat, uh, how many beats per minute. We know our blood pressure. We, you know, no, I'm not talking about that. You, you know you know your, your motives, you know your motivation, you know your desires. And that's what we want to talk about here. Uh, we, we've, we've given the theme for this week of prayer uh, is just one word, obedience. Obedience. Now, sometimes as soon as you say obedience, there's every, it, it, everybody has their own perspective on what that word means, obedience. If you're a parent, you're like, oh, yeah, I wish I could get my kids to obey me. You know, and, 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 you know, but obedience can be very challenging. We, we're talking about personal obedience. We're not, gonna, we're not talking about pointing fingers at others and, 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 you know, sometimes obedience, again, the perspective could be you talk about obedience and all of a sudden you, we feel condemned. We feel condemned. And, and, and the enemy, he, he, he latches on to that. Satan, he, 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 he takes hold of that and he, he says, oh, uh, you, you, you know you're going to fall short here. You know, already you say, well, we're just going to get beat up here today by uh, this message, and uh, we're going to be guilted into uh, being a part of a, a week of prayer. No, that's not it at all. It's not it at all. But, we, we, you know, the perspective of that word obedience can, can be a couple things. Uh, I, I, think, I think sometimes people, and I, I, I'll use words maybe not, you're not going to use when you talk about obedience, but uh, sometimes the perspective on, on obedience is it's mandatory compliance. You know, mandatory compliance, obey or else. And so that's, uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me, that's where, you know, we, we get maybe under that, that guise of condemnation, mandatory compliance. Hey, you have to do this. You know, this is something you have to do. And it's, again, we're not, that's not our approach at all. Uh, the perspective I'd like to highlight is what I call what I, what, voluntary cooperation. Voluntary cooperation. That's, uh, I think that's what every parent desires. I just wish my kids would voluntarily cooperate with me. You know, because most of the time we feel like we're, we're, uh, we're, 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 we're forcing them into obedience. Voluntary cooperation. You know, when, when John said that we, uh, we keep his commands and, and do what pleases him, that's what John is highlighting, that voluntary cooperation. That, that we, we partner with God. We partner with God for the same desires. Not anything we ask, but for the desires of God. You know, we live in a society, listen, we, we live in a society that has the attitude, I am not going to be told what to do. All right? I mean, pe people, you, know, you could just tell right away, they'll put, you know, the minute you try to encourage them to do something, there's, there's that there's that wall that goes up, and it's, you're not going to tell me what to do. You know, we see signs all the time that tell us what to do, and you know, I think our attitude is, well, I'm not going to be told what to do. It's a funny thing, uh, uh, you know, this has kind of been going over in my mind all week, you know, and, uh, you know but I, 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 I was in Wegmans parking lot, you know, and I was just walking by. You probably don't even think about this, but I, I was walking by the return cart 
cage that they have there, you know, all right? And, and, and again, there's people that they just leave their carts in the middle of the parking lot. You know, I, I came out one time, and there's a cart right against my door. <laughs> and, and there's these, you know, there's the places where you can put your cart. You know, and so, it's, you, know, you know, but some people, hey, I'm going to put this cart wherever I feel like, you know. But then I, I noticed as I drove, as I walked by it, and the, the, the one, one of the guys, God bless those guys that have to deal with those carts, you know, and, and bring them back in, you know. And, of course, you know, all right, you know, there's two different kinds of carts, right? There is the smaller cart, which I like. I don't need that big old cart because usually when I get something, I'm just getting the, a, a couple of things. But there's the small cart. And there's the large cart. Well, I noticed this. Maybe you've never noticed this, but I've noticed it. I noticed it just this time, that at that return cart cage, that there's, there's signs there, and the one side is for the small cart, and the other side is for the larger cart. Anybody know that? Have you, have you, did you ever notice that? Yeah. People can't even follow those instructions. I swear, they just... You want me to put a small cart there? I don't want to. I'm going to put it over here. And, and, and I looked in there, and it was a mess because there were small carts where the big carts were supposed to, the big carts were in the small cart. And, and I, I laughed, you know, because I, I was thinking of my message, you know, and I think we live in a society that has the attitude that whether it's a sign, whether you try to tell them that I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do. I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do. And it, it, it's the society in which we live. And we need to understand uh, that, that as God has given us his word, his supernatural word, yes, it's instructions for living, and it's instructions for living in a way that is going to be beneficial to us. I mean, again, you could tell somebody, uh, you know, that, 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 hey, this is going to be good for you. This is going to bless you. But the attitude is, I'm not going to do it because you're telling me what to do. You're telling me what to do. And so we need to, when, when we have this theme, obedience, please don't let your attitude be, well, I'm not going to be told how to obey. This is an encouragement. This is uh, an exhortation that, uh, that as believers that we want to keep his commands. We want to do what pleases the Lord and knowing that it's going to be for our benefit. So uh, I want to talk just real briefly here, uh, three points <clears throat> and as we go into this week of prayer. Again, I'm, I'm inviting you, I'm encouraging you to be a part of it because it will be a blessing to you, that we will be mutually blessing each other as we pray together. And again, I have no doubt that you are praying, that, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're seeking the Lord. But let's, let's do it together, just for a few minutes. Just for a few minutes. And, uh, you know, just, to, you know, again, and I'm not saying, uh, I'm not making, you know, trying to, uh, you know, manda make it mandatory, oh, you got to be here every night. You know, just come out one night. You don't have to come out even for the whole hour. But believe me, the hour goes by fast to come out, to bring your children, that we can pray over your family. And it'll be good for, for, for children to see people pray, to see the church pray, seeking God, calling out to him and, and believing uh, that, that for his will to be done in our lives. So for, I just want obedience and prayer involves three things. Three things, pretty, pretty simple, but they're very challenging. The first two in particular are very challenging. But obedience and prayer involves, first of all, number one, a pure connection. A pure connection. Now, frankly, I, I, just, I, want, I, want, I want to tell you right off the, 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 uh, the beginning here, we are not qualified for that pure connection. We are, are part of it. We, we, we're, we're not one of us. There's not one of us here uh, that has the purity that, that can make this pure connection. But, but prayer involves a pure connection because it starts with a pure heart. A pure heart. That's what God is seeking. He seeks a heart 
that desires him. And I can only give you, uh, one, I'll give you one example. And it's King David. Now, King David, he didn't qualify as well. Uh, he, 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 he wasn't a pure man. Uh, we, we, we know about all uh, of his mistakes, his shortcomings. But what's also told about King David is that he was a man after God's heart. He had a heart for God. And, and, and that, provide, that was the pure connection that, that God desired and, and had with King David. Now we can use another example, the predecessor of King David. Remember King Saul? King Saul, the first king for Israel, and he was anointed to, uh, to, to be king. Uh, but, it, you know, we, we, we could see his example that, that, that there, there wasn't that pure connection because he did not have a heart for God. It's, re, it's very reminiscent uh, of, of Israel and, and their victory at Jericho. Pastor Bill shared the message last week, uh, you know, uh, in regards to uh, the great victory over, over Jericho. But there was disobedience. There, there, there wasn't a, a pure heart on, on the part of, of one person. Now, we, we can see the same thing with King Saul. There was another time that God gave a victory. God guaranteed a victory. We find it, if you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but to give you a, a, just an idea of what's taking place here, is God spoke through Samuel, the prophet, to King Saul, and he guaranteed there would be a victory over King Agog and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and the Amalekites. <clears throat> and, and that, uh, you know, he said, you're going you're to be victorious. You need to totally destroy them. The instruction was that there was going to be victory and that, that, that King Saul was to totally destroy King Agag and the Amalekites. And Saul didn't do that. He spared the king, and, and they, they, they took all the, uh, the, 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 the choicest sheep and cattle and, and, and kept all that, didn't destroy uh, that. And then even when Samuel tried to correct Saul, Saul insisted, insisted, oh, I obeyed the Lord's commands. And Samuel, maybe a little sarcasm there. He said, well, what's all that bleeding I hear? What's all the lowing of cattle I hear? I hear all this sheep. What, what, what's that, Saul? But King Saul still insisted that he had obeyed, he obeyed God and obeyed the commands of God. And so there wasn't that pure heart. There wasn't that, uh, that pure uh, heart and desire and motive to be connected with God, that Saul did his own thing. Basically said, I'm not going to be told what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to do what God instructed him to do. Then Samuel replies to Saul, and it's verses 22 and 23. Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. Because see, King, King Saul, he tried to justify, oh, you know, we, we kept these because we're going to offer them as a sacrifice to the Lord. And the Lord, his reply was that he doesn't, he doesn't delight in just mere offerings and sacrifices, but he desires a heart that delights in obeying the Lord. He goes on, he says, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of, of rams. For rebellion, disobedience, rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Again, God knows the heart and that's what he desires is a heart, a pure heart that desires to be obedient. Are, are, are we going to be perfect? No. No, there's no one. There's no one that's perfect. Jesus Christ himself is the only one that was completely obedient, without sin, completely pure, and had that pure connection. But God knows the heart, knows the desire, and his mercy 
and his grace makes it possible. We need to understand Satan knows this. Satan knows this. He knows the power uh, of prayer and that pure connection, that, that where there's a heart that desires to seek the Lord. That, 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 that God will do so much. Do so much in that life. And Satan knows it, and so he, he tries as much as possible to, to, to break off that connection. To break it off and, uh, with temptation and, uh, and disruption and distraction and, uh, and whatever it can be. You know, even just say, well, you just forget. We just forget. Is that a sin? No, it's not a sin. But it's, again, just that uh, we allow our lives, our lives to be so filled that we don't have time to pursue that pure connection, that pure connection. We know that the Lord is as abundant in mercy as he is serious about the disobedience and sin. And because of his mercy, he allows there to be that pure connection because that pure connection can take place because of number two, a penitent correction. A penitent correction. You know, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it's a familiar verse. When, when, when there's weeks of prayer, when there's times of prayer, when there's times of consecrated prayer, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is used very often. And, it, and it, it's a good verse. It's a good verse, but do, I, I don't know if you understand the context of that verse. Because what's going on here is King Solomon, he has just constructed this magnificent temple in honor of the Lord. It had been the vision of his father David, and Solomon was able to, uh, to get the resources and to, uh, to rally the people, and they had built this temple uh, that was for the Lord's presence. Again, throughout the wilderness, they had uh, wandered, and there was the tabernacle that, uh, the, that they brought with them and constructed uh, there throughout the wilderness, and, and there wasn't anything, uh, a place uh, like that, and, and, and David's vision for it, and now Solomon ha- had brought it to uh, completion. And, the, and in chapter 6 of Second Chronicles, uh, there's the dedication of the temple to the Lord and that the Lord's presence would fill the temple. And in that prayer of dedication, King Solomon, he asks of the Lord, he asks that the Lord would make a way for Israel to be forgiven when they sin. He, Solomon recognized that we're imperfect people. We're not, we're not pure, uh, and, and that uh, we, we, we need a way of forgiveness. And so then, as God speaks forth his word in response to the dedication of the temple. That's where we have 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And then verse 14, what does it say? His answer is repentance. His his answer is repentance, a penitent correction, repentance. What did God say? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their, heal their land. A repentant heart uh, is that, 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 that heart that makes that correction, that turns from the evil ways, turns from the sin and the impurity. A, a repentant heart is that pure heart that makes that pure connection possible. There's humility There's praying to and seeking the Lord. There's turning away from sin. There's the recognition that that we need the Lord. We need the Lord. And and so the consecration of ourselves, of our time to seek the Lord. That's what this week of prayer is. It's a consecrated time. It's to enhance whatever you're doing as an individual in praying, whatever we're doing as a church. We are enhancing it for a week for a season, for a time. It is consecrated for the Lord. And it's part part of that, uh, making that correction, that penitent correction. Maybe that's what, you know, again, as we have a week of prayer, we need to to make that time. Our 
general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Doug Clay, in an article for uh, a week of prayer that, uh, again, many churches start the year out with. But in an article, he wrote, he, he, he said this, he used this comparison, that, that a believer that isn't praying is like an empty cup. An empty cup. There's nothing there. It's empty. And, and, and really, you could say that cup, it's not being used. It's not being resourceful. It's empty. But he said, we need to remember all it takes is for that cup to begin to get filled. And that, that's what praying, that's what prayer does, is that uh, as we pray, God begins to fill us. And again, that that cup can go from an em- empty cup to where it's overflowing. It doesn't take long, right? I mean, you've, you, you, you've filled up a cup at your sink, you know, and, and, and it doesn't take long. It'll be overflowing. It's the power of prayer. It's the power of prayer. And, and it's that, that idea of, 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 of repentance and making that correction so that there can be that pure connection. And lastly, uh, we highlight that, that the obedience in prayer involves a pleasant commission. A pleasant commission. That, that when, uh, when we experience that place of prayer, when we uh, have that place of prayer individually, and then when we even come together corporately, when we, where it says where two or three are gathered in his name, that he's there in the midst. And, and we need to understand there, there, there's, a, uh, there's a delight uh, there's a, 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 a joy. There's a rejoicing, a pleasant commission. Psalm 37, the psalmist write, writes these words in Psalm 37, I just highlighting verses three through five. But it speaks of a commitment to obedience. What does the psalmist say? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. There's a joy. There's a gladness. There's a victory. There's triumph. That as we trust in the Lord, uh, that, that as we make this commitment, prayer is just that. It's committing our ways to the Lord. Committing ourselves to the Lord that we will seek him. We will seek him with all of our heart, that we'll, uh, we'll desire for that pure connection and, and, and that we'll, uh, we'll make that, uh, that repentant correction, whatever, whatever is needed, and that we tr- it's trusting in the Lord and that it, there's, joy, it, there's joy. That's why, you know, obedience, if we look at obedience as some type of mandatory compliance, there's no joy in that. We're being forced to obey. I, you know, there, 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 there's no joy there. There's, uh, the outcome is, is that it's almost robotic. That we're doing it because we have to. There's no joy in that. That's not what God desires. God, the, the psalmist says, take delight in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your, your heart. And the, the idea of that voluntary cooperation that, that we, uh, we want we want to, uh, to seek the Lord. We desi- it's our desire to do what pleases him and, and, and that we can have confidence there. And, and so uh, as, as we approach this week, please don't, you know, don't, don't, don't make it something that is you know, it's mandatory. Or, uh, you know, I have to do this. Oh, pastor taking attendance. I don't take attendance. I, I just take joy and and. and and, and, you know, coming together and, and, and uh, you know, seeing people pray and pray for each other. And, and that's what it's all about, is to, to, to make uh, those connections and the, to make that connection with God. 